Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos or have sent to me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. As I'm speaking with you right now uh, on this uh, Sunday when I post this video, I'm actually at the Reason Rally uh, and am sure, you know, have posted some, uh, some good stuff to our Sensibly Speaking podcast site and uh, on Twitter and whatnot, so I hope you guys have been following on that, and if not, check it out. And, um, and also, today, I, uh, as I'm recording this before, <laughs> before Reason Rally occurs, I've also um, got some pretty interesting content coming up for you guys that I think you're going to enjoy. So, um, so you'll be watching for that this next week and in the coming weeks. So for now, let's go ahead and get on with some of your questions. Spike Robinson, I was just listening to you answering the question about the two triangles, and you mentioned how Hubbard posited that these triangles always work as he describes, and it got me thinking how often Hubbard uses the absolutes always, never, invariably, etc. Now, we know that Hubbard also described the SP, the suppressive person, as always speaking in general absolute terms. Pretty darn obvious, yes? He's describing himself. There's a few other places, I'm sure you'll know them better than I do, where he defines some quality of an SP and then demonstrates the same behavior or characteristic himself, almost in the same breath. So my question to you is, knowing what you know of Hubbard, do you think he was leaving these in-your-face clues to his true nature in his work, deliberately showing his victims the wires and the pulleys of his deception and laughing all the way? No, I really don't think that was his intention. I don't. Um, I know that there were many places where he contradicts himself. There were many places where, uh, you know, and this is over a 10, 20, 30 year span. So it'd be pretty amazing if he didn't contradict himself at least a few times during the course of going from Dianetics all the way through to all of the materials of Scientology. And in fact, he contradicted himself quite a few times. I also know that there were places where he changed his mind about things right, on purpose and, you know, so was going in one direction and then said, yeah, no, we were doing this, but actually we need to be doing this and, and that sort of thing. And I think that there, you know, when you look back on some of what he was talking about, especially when he's talking about hypnotism, methods of mind control, methods of implanting people with thoughts and suggestions and, and, and uh, using undue influence on people, you know, you, you know that he, the way he talks about it, he definitely knew about the, the methodologies of this stuff, and he knew how to do it, and he was doing it. But I don't know that he was, you know, sort of sneakily trying to, to tell people he was doing that to them. And in fact, when he said things about, like, for example, hypnotism, he would stress points like, you know, yes, Dianetics has similarities to hypnotism, except we're not putting people to sleep, we're waking them up, right? Um, and he would, he, so he would sort of throw these, these curves in there, right? Or he um, said that uh, there were many times where he talked about the fact that Dianetics and Scientology uh, guidelines, methodologies, rules, whatever, discoveries, could be found in earlier works. And yet he then said, but the difference is that we've called out from those earlier works, the important points, right? Where he would say, okay, we have, you know, fact A that we've discovered, and maybe fact A was also mentioned in some earlier work from 1910 by, you know, Krishnamurti or something, right? But also Krishnamurti buries fact A amidst all of this other stuff that's not true and doesn't have any, you know, focus or reason or truth connected to it, and so we've plucked out fact A and given it its proper perspective and proper importance, and therefore it's not, you know, he doesn't say, and therefore it's not plagiarism, but that's pretty much what he's saying, right, is, is yeah, we, 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 we copied stuff from other people, but, but this is the excuse and the reason why. So I think that he was um, pretty clever, and I think he was, um, you know, using his cleverness to justify or explain away 
concerns people were having as he was talking about this stuff, because Hubbard was not considered the, you know, the patron saint of all that is true and holy um, for a number of years, right? In the 1950s, um, he had a lot of time that he had to prove himself to his followers. And he lost a lot of followers, especially with the Dianetics tanking and that whole fiasco. So building up Scientology, he had a lot of explaining to do. And I think he was, um, you know, really using his gray cells to, to justify and, and explain away inconsistencies or problems or plagiarism or whatever. And so now we might look at those things and say, um, you know, oh, he was, you know, being so crafty and stuff. But I don't, I don't know that he was being so crafty. I think he was, um, you know, crafty in that, you know, maybe some of the explanations he came up with. But I think really he was just making his way as he went and making it up as he went along, you know, and uh, until the 60s when he'd actually started formulating some systems and some, some structures and, and some standard, you know, methodologies to auditing procedures and uh, his methodology, his, his, um, his mythology, right, the whole, you know, creation thing and OT and all that stuff. That started getting really structured in the 60s, and that's when he took on the persona of the, you know, patron saint of all that is holy and true, and wrote Keeping Scientology Working, and the much more dogmatic approach that he took to the subject. So, um, so that's kind of how I look at it, is, is I don't think he was, uh, I, think, I think he was laughing all the way to the bank, in some respects, but I think he also believed in what he was doing enough that he sold himself on his own con. And he's a complex guy, so it's not, it doesn't come down to an easy explanation for Hubbard, and it never has. And that's some of my <laughs> probably rambling thoughts on, on an answer to this question. Robert Hammond. Great video, Chris. Isn't the Scientology cross also related to Aleister Crowley's occult symbolism? Can you talk more about Hubbard's plagiarizing ideas from the occult, Hinduism, and other sources? And Tim Weatherhill. I'm having some confusion about the Scientology cross. Didn't Hubbard pick that up from something Aleister Crowley was using? I heard this somewhere, perhaps in tinfoil hat territory online, that at one point Hubbard and Jack Parsons were fooling around with so-called sex magic in the LA area. Am I standing alone in a field on this one? No, Tim, you're not standing alone at all, and in fact I talk about this in uh, my book, Scientology A to Zenu, I actually discuss in some detail uh, Hubbard's association with Jack Parsons and the occult and uh, Aleister Crowley, and, uh, or uh, Crowley, I think is, is actually how you pronounce that. Um, and the deal is that Hubbard got mixed up in 1945, 46, 47, something in that time period, with Jack Parsons. Jack was a uh, rocket scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And in fact, he had a, um, a mansion, a, a very large, uh, you know, house, about five minutes from where I grew up in Pasadena. I, I, my, my paper route used to go right by that house. Um, and, and Hubbard boarded there uh, at Jack Parsons' place, as did other people who were sort of occult followers and, and odd birds and that sort of thing. And... Um, and within a very short time, Hubbard ingratiated himself into Jack Parsons' life, and Jack Parsons was a um, acolyte or follower of Aleister uh, Crowley. And um, the sex magic was part of Crowley's whole, you know, uh, mystic uh, Ordo Templi Ordinus thing. I mean, you know, and I, I don't know all the stuff off the top of my head now, but um, but there was definitely a black magic, sex magic, occultism, you know, some people have referred to it as Satanism, but I, I don't think that's an accurate description of what Aleister Crowley was, was about. Uh, I don't think he was a, he was a Satan worshiper or a, a follower of Lucifer or something. I'm not, I don't think that's an accurate way of, of talking about what he was about. Um, Hugh Urban has actually done some pretty championship academic work uh, on this subject, and I'll put a link below to an article that uh, Tony Ortega did uh, where he talked about a paper that Keith Urban wrote about this um, where he went into quite a bit of detail about 
uh, Hubbard's plagiarizing Crowley's work for Scientology, you know, years following. But also indicating that it wasn't just a straight copy. Hubbard really had his own ideas about this stuff and, and really was a true believer. And the proof that he was a true believer in this occultism is the affirmations. And those are also listed in my book. In the, in the appendix of my book, I, I put the full affirmations there. And, um, and Hubbard refers in those affirmations, which were written by him for him. They weren't written for anybody else. They were never meant to be seen uh, any, anywhere else. They were self-hypnosis commands and, and, and uh, things that Hubbard was using to, to pump up his ego and pump up his morale and that sort of thing. And, and, he, and he was using this on a self-hypnosis basis, playing it back to himself. Uh, I believe on, uh, on, on discs, on, on little recording discs. So, um, so Hubbard's a true believer in the occult. Hubbard hooks up with Jack Parsons. They do engage in sex magic rituals, uh, which follow Crowley's teachings. Uh, so Hubbard's aligned with this, but then Hubbard goes his own way because he's a con man also, and he tried to rip Jack Parsons off, uh, and did rip Jack Parsons off of, of thousands of dollars, and took Jack Parsons' girlfriend at the same time. And that ended up being Hubbard's uh, second wife, um, who he married while he was still married to his first wife. So there was all kinds of shenanigans going on in the late 1940s in Elwin Hubbard's life. This is all totally detailed in, um, in the book Barefaced Messiah. So I don't need to, you know, lay out the entire, entire story all over again here, but I will refer you to those uh, sources. Russell Miller's book, Barefaced Messiah, is, is absolutely um, must read. And, you know, if you're a Scientology follower or uh, L. Ron Hubbard uh, follower or watcher, or you're interested in this stuff, then, um, then I highly recommend you read that book, as well, of course, as reading my book. So, um, so that's, that's a little bit about this. There's a whole lot more to be talked about in terms of the, the Scientology cross, getting back to the original question on this, Yes, that does come from um, a cross the, called the Rosy Cross that Crowley was using, which was taken der a derivative from earlier sources. The eight-pointed uh, star or cross that, that's used in Scientology is definitely derived from that. Hubbard came up with some uh, story that it was that that cross came from a, um, I think, an archaeological dig uh, that was occurring in Arizona. And uh, from some Spanish cross or something, I, I, I guess. Um, but I think that was total balderdash, and I think he uh, knowingly took that from Crowley's work. So, um, so there's that. Lawrence Hyatt. I was recruited into the cult of Scientology back in the 70s through my friend's doctor. He was having emotional problems at the time and went to his doctor for help. His doctor said there was nothing he could do, but referred him to the local Scientology org. I went along to support him and got mixed up in it for a time until I walked. Have you heard of any other outside agencies recruiting for Scientology services that people should be aware of? Well, here's the thing about this. Scientologists come in all shapes and sizes and all walks of life, and they get paid to get people recruited into Scientology. And I've talked about this in earlier Q&A videos. I've talked about the field staff member and the commission system that Scientology has. And they, they pay out cold, hard cash to people uh, pretty, pretty fast for getting new people in. So this doctor sounds like somebody who was probably already affiliated with Scientology and was probably sending people over to the uh, local church of Scientology and getting commissions for it. So that's my first guess, right? Um, Otherwise, the guy was just a total dupe and thought, you know, back in the 1970s that Scientology was a good thing and had heard good things about it or something and so decided to refer people over there for mental health purposes. Uh, that's not unheard of. That could have happened as well. Um, I can't classify any particular body or group and say, you know, watch out for these guys except for Scientology front groups and they are legion. Um, there are, if you actually Google Scientology front groups, you will find extensive lists of these things. Websites and, and, and groups and business groups and, and uh, consulting groups and um, child literacy uh, mentoring groups. 
of course, drug activism, anti-drug activism groups, anti-psychiatry groups, all of these can have associations with Scientology, and, and many do. So, really, you have to look at each individual that you're coming, you know, uh, individual groups, right, that you're coming in contact with, if they have um, similar sounding uh, propaganda or, um, or literature to what Scientology puts out, say anti-psychiatry stuff or the you know, anti-drug literature, etc., then you know, if it sounds like Scientology, it probably is Scientology. And that's, that's pretty much my best advice on that. They are out there, they are something to be aware of, but you know, Scientology's gotten so small and it's so widely known now how toxic it is that, um, that I think the, the um, chances of running into somebody who's going to be trying to get you into Scientology is so much less now than it was back in the 70s. Robert Tobias, why did the U.S. government take such an aggressive approach to the rather benign Branch Davidian cult, which resulted in the horrific deaths of men, women, and children, and yet the U.S. government continues to maintain a laissez-faire attitude toward all of the serious crimes of the Church of Scientology. I looked into the Branch Davidian Waco siege that occurred, um, you know, many years ago, I think it was in the late 90s, and it was horrifying. I mean, the, the ATF, the, the um, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is a branch of the United States government, completely abused their power in a, a horrifying way and to horrifying results, and the FBI got involved as well. And their actions were unconscionable and, um, and, and certainly worthy of contempt. Now, that being said, uh, because of, you know, and if you want to look into what, the, what happened in that Waco siege, you'll, you'll quickly see what I'm talking about. Um, however, the Branch Davidians were no saints, and David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, was, was not a good guy. He was a, a, a child molester, a pedophile, um, and they were not up to good things there. However, when it came to the letter of the law uh, on guns, they apparently, from what I was able to read and dig up on this, they followed the letter of the law. And the reason that they were uh, besieged and gone after was for suspected violations of, of guns, of, of, of collecting you know, an arsenal, and they did have an arsenal on their grounds, of uh, M16 you know, uh, semi-automatic weapons. Now, although there was not just cause for this, they were raided because the agents of the ATF said that they could convert those M16s to full automatic weapons, which would be illegal, and got a judge to sign off on them, um, you know, going after the Branch Davidians for that reason. There were lots of other reasons they should have been going after the Branch Davidians, mainly the child abuse that was going on on the grounds there. Now, whether the adults were cooperating or not, the, the minor children who were in there having, you know, uh, sex with uh, David Koresh, I mean, that was, that was really bad. And, uh, and nothing I'm saying about the uh, unjust or, or uh, you know, militant actions of the ATF or the FBI or any, you know, attempt on my part to excuse the actions of the Branch Davidians or their complicity with letting David Koresh have his way with, with young children. It was disgusting. I mean, there was just, the whole thing was just gross. So, um, so that was the basis on which they went into that, that compound, was the, was the weapons cache and the, um, the idea that there was uh, some kind of paramilitary action going on in there, uh, like it was some kind of a survivalist compound or something. Now, what sparked the ATF to get such a hard-on to go after them in the first place? I'm not totally sure. You know, the, the string goes down to uh, the weapons. And... You know, when it comes to Scientology, there is no such fear. Uh, Scientology does not particularly cache or have big weapon stocks. Um, you know, there was, uh, with the Branch Davidians, there was mail being sent. They were mail ordering weaponry, and they were mail ordering ammunition and whatnot. And this, this you know, there were, in the, there were reports and such of, of this stuff, um, you know, getting into the Branch Davidian compound. There's no such thing with Scientology, right? They have some uh, shotguns and weapons, I'm sure, at the Int base, and I know for a fact they have shotguns and pistols at the, at the Pacific base, the big blue buildings, uh, in, locked up in security, in the security cabinets. 
But, um, but, but Scientology is generally, while they have a paramilitary sea organization, those people are not weapons trained. I mean, I can just tell you, I, with no question whatsoever, that none of those people are preparing for any kind of, um, you know, uh, bunkering in and, and military type sieges and, and, uh, and anything like that, nor are they prepped for any kind of Jim Jones final solution where they're all going to drink the Kool-Aid or something. It's not, doesn't, Scientology doesn't really have that kind of flavor to it. Um, and internally, inside Scientology, I don't think anybody in that group would, would particularly go for something like that, that I know of. Um, you know, they'll defend their, their, their buildings and whatnot. I know during the LA riots, they certainly, you know, had a bunch of men circling the buildings and they brought out some rifles and whatnot when the, that was going on. Um, but that's, that was in response to literally looting and rioting going on right outside their buildings. So, you know, that's, that's not quite the same thing as what the Branch Davidians were doing. Um, I wish the government would go after Scientology. I wish a raid could occur. I think, honestly, one other part of this answer that has to be said is that Scientology seems to have, very, well, they do have very deep pockets, and they seem to have um, very high connections with um, within certain government circles. And I say that because there was a raid that was going to occur, reportedly, uh, at the int base by the FBI within the last few years, and that was called off literally within a day or two of it supposed to you know, be scheduled to happen, because somebody high up in the FBI was, um, you know, somehow influenced by Scientology in some way to send orders down the line to cancel the full investigation and raid that was going to occur. And that's according to reports I've read from Mike Rinder and Marty Rathman. So you can find that stuff online. So I think that also plays a part in why Scientology hasn't received the attention it should from certain government agencies where they have given it attention, but then that attention gets cut off at the knees. Um, you know, when action is, is supposed to be taken. So that's about all the, between the conjecture and the actual information I have, that's the best answer I can give you right now. Laura Marie. People leave Scientology and the like for the obvious reason that it is a destructive cult, but it did provide at some point a sense of spirituality and belonging for them. What do you think of the recent decrease in organized religious beliefs and behaviors generally in society? particularly in the millennial generation, who say they do not belong to any organized faith. Do you see any similarities in people leaving organized groups, cults, or otherwise? Absolutely, and the common denominator is education and, um, and the uh, availability of, of information, the free availability of, of finding out what these groups are all about. I am no fan of organized religion, and I haven't been for quite some time, for pretty obvious reasons. And, um, and I've talked about the abuses of organized religion, and yet at the same time I preach tolerance and understanding and compassion for individual beliefs. I will uh, never you know, get down on somebody for having individual beliefs of their own about the supernatural or God or the afterlife or whatever. I got, I got nothing on that. But when it comes to organized religion, I think that there are so many um, authoritarian, um, you know, methods and even totalitarian control systems in place that people aren't even aware of. And the undue influence is, is amazing, it's shocking. Uh, and this includes the Catholic Church and the Christian Church and any church. Um, this, this kind of thing goes on. It's just, a, it's just part of human nature that when you put people in power positions, they abuse that power. Not everybody, but enough that it's noteworthy. And the abuses with the Catholic Church, for example, are, are quite extensive and, and quite horrifying. So that's not to say that every priest and you know, every Catholic priest is a pedophile or something like that, but, but there's enough that it's alarming and, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm sometimes alarmed by the, you know, the tendency of some Catholics to write that off. Uh, you know, then there's the extremism that we see in, in certain Christian sects. And the Westboro Baptists, for example, or the you know some of the evangelicals and this sort of thing, 
Um, these, these become extremist groups. And, uh, and of course, I've said it's not just religious groups, but in answer to the question here, the, the, the remedy or the, 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 the antidote or the thing that seems to proof people up against falling, for, falling into these totalitarian extremist groups is, is education, right? Is knowing better. And, um, I mean, you know, if I had known a few key things uh, when I had first walked into a church of Scientology, then I wouldn't have fallen for it. But I didn't know those things, and I didn't let myself, you know, come to know those things for quite some time. Uh, because once you, you know, the way, we've talked about the mind control at length, so I won't get into it again here. Um, so I think the same thing that can prove people up from getting involved in destructive cults, generally speaking, keeps people from getting involved in organized religion in the first place, and doesn't necessarily take away from their own ideas of spirituality, or the supernatural, or the afterlife, or God, or the nature of those things. Um, so, and I think that's interesting. I think it's very interesting from what I've seen. You know, we, we have seen an increase in the, in the nuns, you know, these surveys that get done where, you know, what's your religious affiliation? None. Right? And yet, there's still a, a good percentage of those people who do have spiritual beliefs of some kind and readily say so. So, um, so I, think the, I think the first line of, of, of what education and information gives is, um, is we're seeing decreasing membership in, um, in organized religious groups. Right? We're also seeing, uh, and another factor that I think is important with organized religious groups that also drives people away from them is outmoded belief systems and outmoded uh, rules and, and, and trying too hard to control too much, right? And, uh, and I, I, we talked about this actually recently on my podcast. Um, the Catholic Church, right, because of its very backwards views on, um, on abortion, family planning, birth control, things like that, there's more and more, statistically speaking, there's more people leaving, especially women, over the last 30 years, you know, the number of women who have been attending Catholic Church has been going down uh, at what should be an alarming rate as far as the Catholics are concerned. And, um, and that's, that also is a reflection of the Catholics, you know, inability to recognize that women's rights are, are, and human rights are a very real thing. And there's much more awareness of that now than there ever has been before. Much more. And statistically, this shows in a number of different metrics. So, I think that's also a contributing factor um, to, you know, people being proofed up against this stuff. And it's time for Flash Answers. George Boslaw, have you ever been on the Free Winds, and what was she like? Nope, I've never been on the Free Winds. I've never seen her. I've never been anywhere near her. And, um... I heard that, that it's, a, it's a really great ship with a lot of great food. That's what most, uh, most Sea Org members I ever met who had been on the ship always talked about was the food. So I'm sure the food was great. Yaza Yates. My question is just a quick one regarding Scientology front groups. I watched your video on the subject and was curious as to whether or not an organization named Able Child is at all affiliated with Scientology. There are mixed responses when trying to research this myself online there seems to be ties to Scientology groups like CCHR and beliefs such as a very strong anti-psychiatry stance. This even goes as far as to blame all school shootings on psych drugs. However, some Able Child websites deny any connection to Scientology. From what I could see in looking at the Able Child information and um, doing my own little online research on it, I think I would fall, and this is just a guess, it's pure supposition on my part, but I, I believe that that is a Scientology front group, uh, or certainly a group that is heavily aligned with Scientology. Um, and even, you know, has, there was even an article on their website about praising Tom Cruise for, you know, taking the stand against psychiatric uh, drugging, right, when he was on Matt Bauer's show back in 2005. So, um, so I don't really see any reason to be associated with Able Child in any way. Um, because basically their stance on psychiatry is, is actually kind of a rabid dog approach anyway and isn't particularly worthy of support. Katrine Barrett, 
Do CO members have IDs? I have known several ex-SO and ex-military members who didn't get their driver's licenses until later in life simply because they didn't need one when they lived on base. Military members have government-issued IDs, so that's not really an issue for them, but what about SO? Do they simply have no ID cards? You can't get on a plane or do any number of other activities without ID, so I wonder if this is a sort of control method. Also, what about members who are from other countries? Do they get to keep their passports and visas with them, or do they get locked away for safekeeping? Thanks for your time and all your hard work. Yeah, Sea Org members have IDs. I had a driver's license the entire time I was in the Sea Org. Um, there's nothing that says you can't have IDs when you're in the Sea Org, and they're often necessary to travel or do lots of things. Uh, you certainly can't drive without a driver's license, and the Sea Org needs people who can drive. And when you're driving, you have to have your driver's license on you. So, um, when you're in a um, trouble in the, in, in the Sea Organization, not in other Scientology places, but at the Sea Org level, they will take your, they will confiscate IDs, passports, and whatnot, so that you can't easily get away. Such as when you're on the Rehabilitation Project Force, the RPF. Um, you can't, you know, you don't get to carry around your ID and whatnot when you're uh, in that group, right? And when you go on the free winds, um, they collect all the passports and everything, too. They say that there's some kind of law about that. I haven't looked into it enough to know whether that's true or not, as to whether they're supposed to have your passport or not. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me that they would, but, but that's the justification they use, at least, in, in confiscating all the crew's uh, passports when they're on the ship. And uh, Otherwise, they do have Sea Org-issued ID cards, which they use to um, gain access with magnetic strip uh, to various places on the bases, um, and they can control who gets to go where on the Sea Org bases using those Sea Org ID cards. Okay, and with that, we have reached the end of our show. I hope that these answers have been interesting and informative for you. Um, you know, I'm doing my best here to keep up with everybody on, uh, and some of the amazingly interesting questions that you ask. For my um, Patreon supporters, I want to thank you very much for the support you guys have given. And if you would care to take a look, um, you can check out the link below to my Patreon site and, uh, and throw me some love and support if you like what I'm doing. So until next week, thanks for stopping by and I'll see you later.